Good evening. Thank you all so much for coming to our third Peace Studies lecture of the semester in our Peace Studies lecture series. Um, with great honor and pleasure, I'm welcoming Dr. Lorenzo Trombetta on behalf of AUR and our Peace Studies Master's program. Uh, Dr. Trombetta is a Beirut-based researcher specialized in contemporary Syria with 20 years experience as an analyst, journalist, and consultant living and working in the Middle East. He has long-standing experience in understanding the complexity of the entire region with a particular focus on local context in Syria and Lebanon. In terms of his academic credentials, he holds two masters, his first at the University of Rome in Sapienza, and his second in journalism and new media at the University of Rome, with a PhD in the University of Paris. He did his dissertation on the structure of the Assad regime, which is particularly relevant to all of the context that's happening today. Uh, he devoted much of his academic studies to studying the structure of the control and repression systems in Syria under the Ba'ath Party and the Assad's. He authored two books on contemporary Syria and several scholarly papers and chapter books based on a proven track record of academic study, field research, consultancy work, and day-to-day -day personal experience with the multifaceted Middle Eastern context. He's also highly uh, awarded with awards in international research from the International Research Institute Disarmament Archive, Syrian Studies Association, and the International Prize of the Mediterranean. Uh, and finally, before I present him, his ability to present contents and insights in a lively way to journalists and policymakers is won him a lot of acclaim and renown. He has developed a strong capacity to make complex issues seem understandable uh, and relatable, which is why we are so excited to present him here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ivana, for this uh, presentation. I hope to, um, to be at the same level of expectation. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Jalto, for giving me the opportunity to be here with you. And also, Carla Valentine, the first initiator of this contact with the American University of Peru. Uh, it's also an honor because um, almost 20 years ago I left Rome and I went studied in, in Syria, in Damascus. Uh, I don't live in Rome anymore, uh, but still it's my city. It's the first time that I talk to a non italian audience about my passion in Syria and the Middle East. So I'm particularly glad to the organizers uh, and to you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I try to um, skew to uh, to compress my intervention tonight no more than 45 minutes in order to give the chance to a dialogue, to a debate among us, uh, not to be too vertical and try to, to widen the the debate with you. But before this, I would like to introduce you to the first point, of, uh, the first main points I would like to raise and to, to stimulate the debate afterwards. First of all, starting from the title of this presentation, post-conflict, post was put in brackets, as I will try to argue uh, about what is a conflict nowadays in a, in a region called Syria and Iraq. Also, I would like to stress something related to post and pre conflict. Uh, secondly, trying to use a very basic methodology that, of course, you students, you teachers, you um, human beings every day use, like a timeline, uh, chronology, and also maps. Let's try to widen our look at the specific Syria and Iraqi region and widen our uh, reading of, of the conflict itself. Actually, we are often looking at these uh, wars in a very timely uh, way, but also narrowing too much the uh, historical look. Thirdly, trying to raise not only the issue of what's happening on the ground, but also what is told on the ground. How these conflicts or post-conflict situations are perceived 
and narrated are told by people on the ground and also observers outside the, the region, uh, trying to, to introduce very simple basic matrix, again on a methodology approach, uh, talking about levels of conflict and also factors of conflict. Let's see how these two um, layers could interact and could also be an explaining factor to understand what's going on in Syria and Iraq. But Syria and Iraq are also a pretext to talk about something that is wider than that. Uh, emphasizing localism. Localism is something that is always present, is always around us. We usually try, usually to emphasize for from, from far something that is understandable from us. So we usually see Syria and Iraq or the Middle East from a far perspective, emphasizing geopolitical, in brackets, uh, dynamics among big actors. While today I would like to, uh, to ask you to, to come with me into a very localized journey with some few examples. I won't speak so much. Finally, uh, trying to be also propositive and identifying few uh, entry points that could be useful uh, as a civil society members, as teachers, uh, people, people involved in, uh, in academia, research, and also um, journalism, trying to have an aware <coughs> approach of what's going on, and also to see beyond the conflict. Starting from a very general map of the Middle East, without any border, without any labels, uh, you can recognize where we are. The previous map was a map without any uh, layer, or at least the geographical layer, the natural geographic barriers were there. That layer is very, is very crucial. Now I introduced another layer of reading. This is one of the most used layer outside the Middle East and also inside to try to depict, to describe what's going on. A sort of clash of interests between regional and international actors. These colors behind me are a very uh, simplistic uh, synthesis of what's going on nowadays. It's a map updated uh, yesterday. And I will try very uh, quickly to summarize. Uh, the red areas the, are mainly, this, let's say, uh, governative, uh, under control areas. Of course, in Iraq, we have the government of Iraq, in Syria, we have the government of Syria. Let's see what is behind these labels. Uh, government also called regime in a pejorative way. Sorry, if I'm going outside. Um, and uh, beyond the fact that if we like to talk about regime or government, uh, government of Syria and Iraq, actually they have their own uh, allies, affiliations. Inside these governments there are trends, uh, different circles of power. So that's why this uh, homogeneous red is very simplistic. Then we have another color, yellow. There is no connection with the fact that I'm in Rome uh, between red and uh, yellow, but the yellow side is also another very, um, could be very <clears throat> ambiguous definition of the pan uh, Kurdish controlled areas because on the sorry, on on the Iraqi side, we have an autonomous region of Kurdistan. On the other side, we have uh, de facto autonomous uh, Kurd-led uh, Syria region. Then we have another color, the green one, with two different nuances. Uh, the southern part is under in Turkish influence, with Turkish military presence. The upper part is under direct control of the Turkish military. We have other, other colors between Syria and Iraq. First of all, this uh, black, uh, gray uh, parts, where the so-called Islamic State is still, is still there. It's very difficult to define with precise borders 
where the Islamic State is still present. I will try to, to enter into the deeds afterward. And this mostly uh, non-populated uh, step desertic areas is also green because it's not under direct control of the Syrian government and uh, their allies. Actually, there are US American interests here with some pro US Syrian Arab uh, fighters. Studies not to explain what's going on in Syria and Iraq. It's not enough. Let's see something related to time again. Uh, the title is Co Post Conflict Scene. What is a conflict? In our um, broad perception, we consider the conflict in Iraq, the latest conflict in Iraq, the conflict against the Iraqi government and their allies, including the international coalition led by the United States and the so-called Islamic State, with a precise beginning and end of this conflict, 2014-2017. Last year, the Islamic State was formally declared defeated in Iraq. Ceremonies and so on. When the so-called liberation of Mosul, northern Iraq took place. In Syria, we have another official timeline of the latest and ongoing conflict. 2011, first protests in, uh, in various Syrian regions, and later on, repression, violence, war, regional war, and so on. Nowadays, we don't have a clear definition of post-conflict in Syria, the conflict is still ongoing in some areas. But broadly speaking, these are the main uh, general and public also understanding of, of conflict. So in Iraq, we are in a post-conflict, at least officially. But let's try to uh, articulate better what I'm trying to, to explain to you. Let's look at the Iraqi timeline before the conflict officially ended uh, last year. Here we have the Islamic State conflict, but I put few of the many dates that we can find in a timeline. And uh, be careful, this timeline is very concise, very short. Start only in 2003, where President, Iraqi President Saddam Hussein was uh, deposed by the Anglo-American uh, uh, invasion. Then there are other uh, marks on this timeline. We have the beginning of the so-called civil war in Iraq. We have the crack of the Muqtad al-Sadr uprising in Basra and the other uh, main, uh, mainly dominated uh, Shia cities. Then we have 2011, the withdrawal of the US troops, the official withdrawal of the US troops in Iraq. Then they came back, but at that time appeared that it was a uh, major achievement for the timeline of Iraq. Later on, we have the beginning of the Islamic State, the emergence of the Islamic State in the western region of Ambar in Iraq, and then again the first heads chopped by the Islamic State in Iraq and, uh, and Syria, officially uh, the western world and the official uh, chronology makers started to say, okay, we are at war. In Syria, I used a wider, a longer timeline to make things more complicated, but only for explanation purposes. 2011, but before this, the struggle for power in Syria among various actors started long time ago. We cannot say that the conflict in Syria started only in 2011. Someone says that the conflict in Syria didn't start in 2011. 2011 was the eruption of a protest, repressed, and later on 2013, 2012 perhaps. There is a debate about, about this. But let's say that when the Ba'ath party in 1963 took the power, there was a major event where Syrians start to be divided among political, ideology, ideological, sectarian, and also other lines. But again, we have other, I won't go through each day, it would be very fascinating today, but I won't, don't want to, to take too much time to this. Just I would like to emphasize the fact that before what we think about today conflict, history, and also recent history, has something more to say. 
For instance, shall we explain the Syrian, the ongoing Syrian conflict only with the lenses of sectarianism or with the paradigm, with the um, under the spectrum of uh, the political clashes between government and opposition, or saying that there is a so-called minority, uh, al Alawi minority, uh, having the grip on the country where the majority of the Sunni uh, population lives, could be, but it's a little bit reductive. For instance, one of the, let's say, Marxist uh, approach, that is not the, the only one, but could be something, could be a contribution to this socio-economic approach, is emphasizing the <clears throat> uh, economic and social uh, causes of the ongoing conflict. I won't go through this, but just remember what happened, for instance, in Iraq after the war, after right after the, the, the beginning of the American uh, US, the US Anglo uh, invasion, uh, millions of Iraqi escaped to Syria. This had an impact on the Syrian economy, like the Syrian influx on Lebanon and other neighboring countries is having an impact on Lebanese, Turkey, Jordanian, and also perhaps other European countries. Shall we forget, for instance, what the drought in eastern Syria, the Azor, Raqqa, the mismanagement by the government of this uh, natural catastrophe impact on migration from rural areas to Aleppo, Damascus, suburban areas. When we look at the map of the Syrian uprising in 2011, we can read this map also with a socio-economic layer. It's not the only one, of course, but where people had the worst economic situation, they had more uh, let's say they had less to lose than other areas. And it's important to, to remember, for instance, that in July 2012, when Aleppo the city that for almost a year was not under the fire of the revolt was taken by opposition armed fighters. These opposition armed fighters were not coming from the city, from within, from the urban, from within the walls of the city. They came from the rural northern and the rural northern eastern side of Aleppo region. Again, it was not only the revolt for the bread, it was not only something related to socio-economic uh, issues, but also the socio-economic uh, factors could contribute to explain better what's going on. And also, that's why I'm using this, also try to understand, to address the reasons and to try to understand what could, at least we could understand uh, what we could do uh, to explain better, to read better and to explain better the post-conflict situation. There are some post-conflict, short, mid-term uh, repercussion. Uh, today I'm talking, and before coming here, there was um, a car bomb exploded in Nineveh region in, in Iraq. Mosul is the main uh, city of Nineveh. And six people have died uh, in this car bomb. Explosion. The, the attack was not attributed officially to Islamic State, but let's say, local sources attributed this attack to the Islamic State. Every day there are news, unconfirmed reports, but most of them uh, substantial reports of the presence of the Islamic State uh, operating in various rural, not urban contexts in Iraq. Islamic State is not defeated. There is a low intensity Islamic State insurgency nowadays in Iraq. Besides what I, beyond all the slogans of the Mosul liberated by the government forces, the root uh, issues of the emergence of this 
Sunni, popular, non-urban uh, insurgency are still there. And we see the effects, not in Rome, but in, in Iraq. Uh, tomorrow, midterm, we could see a surge of violence, violence escalation in other cities. If we look at the number of fatalities a few months ago, we can say that Mosul, the former uh, capital of the Islamic State between Iraq and Syria, in the last two months, Mosul uh, had a peak of fatalities unprecedented with uh, the previous uh, semester. Let's see, uh, we don't know what could be the trend, but of course the war is not finished. The, insurg the insurgency is still there. Shall we, say, shall we talk about post-conflict? Question mark. Again, Syria, the war is not officially uh, ended. We still have pockets of uh, conflict, open conflict, like we can, uh, we can agree on. But there are also areas where the conflict is still contained. And conflict is not only conflict between two armed groups using weapons, light, meat, heavy weapons. It's also, like I would like to, to show you later, conflict among communities using social, using economic uh, tools to try to, to gain and to, um, to impose themselves over other communities. Also in Syria, despite all the uh, announcement of a new uh, Geneva UN mediated process of negotiations, negotiations, we could have a surge in violence very soon uh, in the next month. But talking about long-term repercussion, new generation of people. I just highlighted a few major uh, consequences of these conflicts in Syria and Iraq. We are talking about almost more than two and a half million children that didn't have access to school for the last years in Syria. Or, for instance, in Iraq, we have at least, there are some figures that are more, uh, that are higher than these, about at least 20,000 Iraqi children without parents. And many of them, not, they don't have uh, legal recognition. That we don't know who the parents are. Some of them are sons of the jihadists who are killed, mother and father. But they are Iraqi. Anyway, they will grow up outside jails, outside the camps, or inside the camps, before or after the screening of the authorities. This amount of children will become the next Iraqi citizenship, citizens in the, in the future. Uh, also, another interesting figures that give, could give us the idea of how society is, uh, has been affected negatively by the conflict. Nothing new, we know about, but can you imagine that only during this year, the first uh, nine months of this year, we had an increase, a tremendous increase of divorces in Iran, in a very conservative and traditional society. It's a very alarming uh, figure that is beyond the fact that if a couple is going well or not. It's something that is disrupting a network of uh, relationships. It would be very interesting to map on a map uh, on, a, on a geographical map where these divorces are happening in rural, in urban, in which community, Christian, uh, Muslim, uh, Kurds, Arab. We can play a lot with all this data, but at the end of the day, I would like to stress the fact that all these um, new uh, results of the conflict postpone the idea of the post. Sorry for, for, the, uh, for this <clears throat> word game. Again, we have another massive amount of orphans, children without parents, also in Syria. And those, that was the cause of only the cause by only uh, seven years of war. In Aleppo, for instance, it's one of the, the main uh, hub of uh, where local NGOs are working, trying to address with authorities, religious authorities, trying to address this, this issue, because only religious authorities 
um, have the permission officially to um, impose a sort of uh, protection to these children, giving them a name, also a religion, the papers, and so on. This could affect also the balance of demographic and also sectarian balance in the future. So, just to stress that don't focus only on what's happening, who, who controls what nowadays, or beyond, or only is a war between uh, this original power and the original power. Few examples. I know that the lecture today was about is about Syria and Iraq, but just to widen a little, a little, little bit our map, something that is not so often told. The Iraqi war again. Another let's let's play again with this timeline. The Iraqi war is officially described as a war between an Arab coalition led by the by the Saudi Arabia and the United Emirates on the second grade. But the United Emirates are working very hard to be the first grade on this uh, coalition, Arab coalition, again, try to deal with uh, uh, something that is very clear. We have Riyadh and Abu Dhabi fighting against a local insurgency in Yemen close to, uh, to Iran. But 2015 is not perhaps the right moment when the, the war started. As we know, the, who's the Yemeni, Zaidid, Shia insurgents started to, to fight the, the central government in Yemen in 2004. 2004, 14 years ago. At that time, the head of the government, the head of the Yemeni regime, was Ali Abdullah Saleh. Ali Abdullah Saleh is a Zaidid, is a Shia, like the, the same insurgents. At that time, we cannot blame the sectarian hard to explain what too simplistic today is explained about a war between Sunni and Shia and Yemen. Today, yeah, it's so easy because we have Saudi Arabia and Iran. But first of all, we should demonstrate very, uh, in a very detailed way what are the links between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Houthi. But we know that Saudi Arabia is playing a leading role in fighting this insurgency. Anyway, so be careful of timeline. In Egypt, there is a war in Egypt, not in Cairo, but in the Sinai Peninsula, since 2011, there is another insurgency, popular, rural, of people who were not represented. People who didn't share the same quota of power or other communities in Egypt started to revolt with an armed way, in an armed way, in a violent way, in 2011. Yesterday, 16 officers, or 16 soldiers of the, uh, sorry, two, two days ago, of the Egyptian army were killed in an ambush uh, in Sinai Peninsula. And Sinai and Yemen, if you look at the map, are very close to something that is called uh, Red Sea. It's very, it's very strategic sea, not only for uh, for the Mediterranean, but for also for the Indian Ocean and for the US interest and the other regional power. Let's see this map. Let's try to widen our, our view. There are main hotspots of violence. We can call civil war, regional war, uprising. That was uh, in Yemen, Sinai. We cannot forget what's going on almost every day in Gaza, Palestine, and Israel. We had very violent protests in Jordan in the, in the few months ago. And uh, the situation, the social economic situation in Jordan is not settled at all. We have in Iraq, we have very much more violent, bloody protests and repression in Basra. Southern Iraq. We had protests, also daily protests in, in Iran, and also we had unrest in southern Iran, and all other peripheral, peripheral cities in Iran. So if we look at this map, beyond the borders, beyond who is uh, uh, Middle East, uh, Arab, uh, uh, not Arab, we can see that the situation is not very unique. The, the, the Syria and Iraq, of course, 
present some peculiarities, but we all uh, live at the Eastern Mediterranean in a sort of uh, boiling uh, context. Lebanon, where I live, where I'm based, is not apparently boiling. Something is official, is uh, for, I grew up in the 80s, where the main uh, association for Beirut was something related to civil war, car bombs, violence. Nowadays, perhaps, Damascus, Aleppo, Mosul are associated with this kind of bloody and terrible things, but it could be a paradox that today, among these boiling scenarios, Lebanon seems the most peaceful, stable place in the Middle East. Again, using a timeline, the Lebanon civil war officially ended almost 30 years ago, 90. The Taif agreement was 89, then some issues. Officially, in the history books, you would find 1990. But we have, until today, many unsolved issues in Lebanon. Very so linked to the some of the, the repercussions that I, would, I was talking to you regarding Lebanon and Syria. For instance, lack of perspective for young people. You will always see queues of Lebanese asking for a visa uh, to go elsewhere. Many Lebanese have double, triple passports. They don't see Lebanon as the land for their future. They're coming in the summer, they're sending money to their relatives. But Lebanon, for young people, is a place to, uh, to start for, for going abroad. It's not a place where you can build your future. Reconstruction, something that would be a buzzword for Syria. Reconstruction is not only a business, it's not only related to infrastructural, tangible, material reconstruction, it's also related to rebuild, reconnect communities. In Lebanon, communities are much more divided nowadays. Or at least after almost 30 years of the end of the civil war, the civil war is still present in Beirut, and not only in Beirut. We have still militias. The main one is the Hezbollah, the pro-Iranian uh, militia in Hezbollah. They are fully armed. They are playing a very powerful geopolitical uh, role, but also a very localized role in Lebanon. They are not only a militia, of course, they are representative in the governments. They are playing a very uh, polite institutional uh, role, but anyway, there are a legacy of the civil war too. Transition, tra uh, transnational, um, uh, um, transitional justice, something again that is uh, one of the the issues that are that is raised since 2012, talking with Syrians, trying to introduce the issue of how you Syrians can reconcile among yourselves and between yourself, between various Syrian communities. You need peace, yes, but some of them ask for justice. All the crimes that have been committed by many parties, mainly the government or the regime, should be addressed. How many NGOs, European and international, trying to work to document, to, to try and to raise this issue of the human rights violations at various courts. Other Syrians who are telling, no, at this time, this issue of justice will cause us more divisions and not, would not be a part of an healing process. The Lebanon lesson is still there. But many uh, Lebanese and non-Lebanese play with the word that this general amnesty considered with the end of the civil war in 1990, uh, was a sort of initiation of amnesia, and more than, a, than an amnesty. Something that I put with a question mark, because the Lebanese uh, lesson is still there. It could be interesting, could be useful for others and present scenarios. 
what happened during the war, something related to memory, to facts, but also narrative and perspective. What happened and what's happening in Syria? Try to introduce something that is very could be very funny if you do this with Syrians, for instance, gather Syrians from different perspectives, from different backgrounds, from different geographies, and ask them, perhaps it's better to do in separate rooms, ask them about what happened at that time in Syria. You will see very interesting contrasting narratives. Uh, I won't go through the entire matrix, but just to say that only the uh, terminology liberation and occupation are very ambiguous and politically used. So be careful when you read about liberation of Mosul. Like in Mosul was, was occupied, but some, but some came from Mars, from another planet. Like Islamic State is not by Iraqis, for instance. But for resistance from an Alpinian or a Mosul businessman, 2012 was the occupation of Aleppo from farmers. From his point of view, he has in his own shop in, shop in Aleppo, then destroyed by artillery of the government. The presence of uh, peasants, farmers, came only 20 kilometers far, was an occupation. Can we challenge this narrative? No, in our position we cannot challenge, but we can record, we try to map and to analyze these this, this different narratives. In order to, to understand what's going on and also try to, uh, to contribute to a sort of a solution, a long-term solution, we should really try to go deeper and deeper and try to understand why they are telling about occupation, liberation, terrorism, and other very uh, tricky word used by many politicians, sometimes used also by journalists, and that is very uh, uncomf uncomfortable to, to hear. But the word terrorist is not a neutral word, it's not something that is describing someone, it's describing a political attitude, it's usually used to delegitimize the other. But from an Islamic state point of view, and we should, we have the moral responsibility to try to go behind the curtain try to understand why the narrative is built in this way, from, this, from their perception that was not terrorism. We should not justify or be morally empathetic with someone who are at least, as a journalist, and try to also to, uh, dismantle narratives, we should have this uh, look at the, also at the most evil actors around the table. Talking about layers and factors. The first map, actually the second map, the one with the colors, was showing you in a very simplistic way the regional uh, architecture of the conflict. We can say, for instance, talking about Syria, usually from Italy, from Europe, we often listen to this geopolitical uh, reading of, uh, yeah, the there is a clash of interest between USA and Russia, Iran and Saudi Arabia, but sometimes, because we are far and we do not, we do, we do not have the same knowledge that we are supposed to have for the regional and the international scenario, we try to avoid entering too much in the national and the local uh, level of the understanding. Uh, we should always remember that all the layers contribute to understand and also contribute to the conflict itself, but also try to contribute to empower ourselves to understand what's going on. We should not neglect the local and the national level, especially the local one. It's not enough to explain the Syrian Iraqi conflict, the Iraq, the, the Yemeni war, only with two main sectarian political ideological blocks. I'm not saying that this international regional level is not offering but it's not the only one. And we, at this side of the Mediterranean, sometimes we prefer, because we don't have tools, usually to understand what's going on in, uh, in Mosul, in Samarra, in, uh, in Ghouta, you have to know the, the local language, you have to read, you have to talk with sources on the ground, something that can you imagine to try to explain the German elections without reading German newspapers without talking with German people uh, in the streets of a remote village in, in southern Germany won't be acceptable. 
for Syria and Iraq, on, from this side of the Mediterranean, and usually is acceptable also uh, from the country where I'm talking now. Again, back to our first map. It's not enough. I'm not saying that it's not true, but it's not enough. Why it's not enough? Only this is only Syria. That is the sectarian way to, to depict the Syrian conflict. There are maps of the so-called Syrian uh, patchwork, something very exotic, very interesting, very true, because we have many, many colors, many ethnic and sectarian differences. I, you can find many, many maps like this, more complex, including Lebanon, uh, including the entire Middle East, beyond the borders. I can continue, just as an example. Iraq, again, another sectarian uh, map. Sectarian and ethnic. Again, sectarianism, communal, let's say community, uh, based uh, reading are not enough. I introduced the second uh, layer of understanding. I have talked about uh, levels and also, I also mentioned before more than once, but let's try to reassume we have political ideological factors of the conflict. We have something related to ethnic sectarian belonging, of course. We have also socioeconomic, I talked extensively about this. We should not forget also the individual factors. There are human beings, militia leaders, politicians, uh, presidents of countries, are human beings with their background, experiences, rivalries, jealousies, and so on. So, I, on my own experience, I, I sense more than once how, the, how much the individual factor, even in society where the, individ, the individual factor is not so uh, clearly uh, present, the individual aspect is also important. We should not forget, we, should, we cannot ignore the, the curriculum vitae, the biography of Vladimir Putin to understand why Putin is acting in Syria in this way. We cannot understand why Bashar al-Assad, president of Syria, is acting in this way if we, if we do not read his biography since the very uh, beginning of, the, of his life. And so on, of course. Uh, this applies to, to every uh, character of our man. Try to synthesize the factors and the layers. When you see the brackets, it's more related to narrative. Not necessarily wrong, but narratives. And so we should try to take them with caution. So we should be cautiously when we, uh, we analyze them. For instance, shall we say that the international level, uh, from a socioeconomic point of view, there is a clash of interest between Russia and the United States. If you look at the map, the general one, the uh, <coughs> Mediterranean, Indian Ocean, Syria and Iraq traditionally have been the corridor, the passage, the gateway from American perspective to the Indian Ocean. Before the American, the, Great, the, <coughs> the British Empire. Nowadays, Russia is still fighting, still trying to exert its influence on the other side, the Mediterranean. So I'm very, I'm flying very, very quickly on these issues that would deserve uh, more deeply analysis. But as a pretext, access to sea is only a synthesis of very complex uh, analysis of two big players of the international level. But at the regional one, for instance, Iran and Saudi Arabia, of course, trying to uh, clash to uh, their rivalries based on, based on uh, market control, not only pipeline, one of the issues uh, often uh, evoked as a main driver of conflict, it's not the only one, of course, access to uh, energy, to oil, gas, water resources is one of the main drivers. We could also remind that Turkey has an ongoing conflict with the PKK uh, that is 
expressing in, uh, itself also in Syria. At the regional level, we, could, we can also insert this uh, reading in our understanding of what's going on in, in Syria. We should not forget, at the national, local level, we are still struggling for resources at central periphery, inter-clan rivalries, Arab first um, conflict, long-standing conflict, and also inter-sectarian divide. We cannot ignore them, but we should see them, we should look at them in a very micro uh, context. Narratives from a sectarian point of view, some prefer to depict the what happening what's up, what happened and what's happening in Syria and Iraq as a uh, an attempt to dislodge the Christians of the Middle East, something related to Islam against us, Islam against the others. It's a very popular this reading. Or again, like I mentioned before, to try to, to simplify things between Sunni and Shia or uh, Arab and Kurds. These factors put in a timeline didn't have, I do not have the same impact at the same time. Trying, imagine to analyze at the social economic level what happened in Syria at the beginning of the crisis in 2011. We can see, for instance, at the time, the socio-economic factor was very high, while the sectarian one apparently was underneath. The discourse was more a revolt for the bread. Later on, the political revolt for freedom emerged more than the bread in some areas. So we are moving in a very uh, complex, but not impossible to understand, scenario where we should go with identify where we are exactly on a map, on a place, and also on, in, on a timeline, try to understand what counted more at the time. The economy, the sectarian divide, the political ideological rivalries, and then again other factors, regional, international, also have the impact. Nowadays, for instance, the Syrians, and not only the Syrians, have the impression, rightly, that the issue of the war and the peace is not anymore in their hands. Effectively, the international layer nowadays has a major impact today, much stronger than before, than 2011. At the time, 2011, the regional international powers, beyond all the conspiracy theories, they were waiting to understand what's going on in Syria. Later on, they stepped their feet on the, on, the, on the ground and the regional and international layer had a broader impact on the conflict dynamics. Back to Syria, because it's a very uh, key uh, pile of examples. I used the map without any colors, trying a uh, circle areas where conflict among communities are in place. Conflict at different levels, not only armed or bloody conflict. Superposing the map of the control, who controls what, we can see we can see that there are only few circles, ovals, that are describing conflict between communities separated by a trench, by a front line. Nowadays, where the Syrian government and their allies almost conquer the entire western Syria, except with Idlib region, we cannot say that the conflict. We cannot say that in Dara, under the same color officially, communities are back to peace. Or in northern Damascus countryside, close to the Lebanese border, or in Homs city and the hinterland, Hama, eastern Hama, so close to the former Islamic State presence, can we say that the Bedouins of eastern Hama are so uh, well connected uh, to the city of Hama? Not at all. I will give you a few examples of how this local conflict could be mapped and also understood, and then a third step, perhaps addressed, on support local communities to, uh, to work. 
let's imagine beyond, before giving you some uh, very concrete and perhaps complex examples, also with many toponyms difficult to understand and to read, but the, the model is very simple. We could have a front line, real or apparent front line. But here in this example, we have a front line, we have community A and community B. Sorry, perhaps. Instead of uh, seeing these two communities colored by, let's say, Sunni, Shia, and see only division, looking at a broader timeline, we can see that many members of these communities, and many members of these communities, Pre before 2011, remember the timeline, had many contacts together. Why? For instance, this is the municipality, and this is a village under the authority of the municipality. Now the front line separated the two. So we have snipers, we have car bombs, we have violence, something that for us is conflict, something like Beirut in the 80s. But beyond these communities exist very deep ties. First of all, administrative ties. Some, some technicians working in the municipalities used to work with the other technicians, engineers, um, um, experts at local level. Another layer we should try to, to understand what could link these two communities before what could divide these two communities. Of course, in a war time, when the economic difficulties are so uh, dire, uh, we have many kidnap kidnapped people on, on both sides, snipers killed. There are also uh, family ties, cousins living here with other cousins, mixed marriage, work relations, and also some tangible economic interests. Sure. For instance, we, have, we could have a water source here and we could have some farming area here that would need the water. But for enabling the pump water to work, perhaps they would need electricity and the main generator is on the other side. This example is not an academic one, it's something a model that I built at home to, to enjoy myself and to, uh, to, to amuse you, but something that is, is there. And try only to simplify things, but something that is there in, in central Syria. So, not at the political level, not talking about peace, dialogue, release of kidnappings, who you killed my cousin, without entering to these very sensitive, political, politicized uh, issues. Technicians of the former municipality and of the ongoing municipality met in the evening using a pretext of uh, focusing on um, uh, cleaning the water channel. There is a water channel close to the main road that during the war, garbage without maintenance, was closed. So they identified the, a problem that the, the Muhabarat, the security apparatus, won't see, won't see like uh, an issue and a political uh, obstacle of letting people of the two sides come in. So the, the security apparatus agreed from the militia side and also from the regime side. At this level, there is no uh, evil and good. Both sides are, are fighting. Both sides have their own security apparatus, both sides are, are imposing uh, restrictions to mobility of people in this area. Anyway, technicians of both sides met for an informal meeting on how to reactivate this water channel. During these meetings, then uh, the, the security apparatus of both sides saw that these meetings didn't uh, alter the balance of power among the two sides, so they, they gave the clearance for other meetings. Through these meetings, 
they agreed on cleaning the water channel. But the water channel is very close to the main road where the snipers are, 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 are shooting. So five hours per day during the, the cleaning session, snipers were told not to fire. People were free, finally, to move around the main road, not repassing the front line, but at least to have five hours of peace. Not with the title of let's do the peace, let's try to be together because we soon now will love the ship. No, not at all, but only for a very tangible uh, issue. I won't tell you the end of the story because I would like to pass to another example. <coughs> we are in Hong City, forget about uh, potatoes, uh, farming areas, water channel. We are talking about neighborhood uh, divided by what in Beirut could be a green line, something the war line, but it's a former war line. There is any more, any physical division among the two sides. But the, <clears throat> the front line is still there. We have Homs city center, very close to, to the old city. And then we have these two areas, very known to be uh, colored by the opposition to the north, and to the pro regime area to the south. Local, uh, let's say, social leader at, le at local level, religious figures, uh, former uh, cadre of the uh, administration of the municipality, identified another tangible uh, interest, trying to restore abandoned orchards, gardens. Not only for kids and for, for children, but also try to use these abandoned gardens uh, for leisure uh, purposes. They, in homes like in other Middle Eastern cities, they like to go, especially in summer, uh, in, uh, in public places to gather with the large family members, smoke uh, the nargile, the uh, what is called uh, in English, the shisha, thank you. Uh, play cards, perhaps you are familiar with this kind of scene, could be very exotic, something very far from our uh, habits. But anyway, the fact that these open spaces, even not so cared or so uh, well organized, could offer a gathering place for both communities, as being perceived by the Homs municipality as something not politically uh, dangerous. The NGO usually say the, the word social cohesion. Anyway, peace building. I don't know if it's a social cohesion or peace building. I know that it was an initiative came from, from the ground, was not imposed or was not a, uh, a solution that both community the vanguard of, the, of both communities, social leaders, not of course the, uh, everybody. There were, there were many uh, people that tried to oppose this idea because was the, the, this was a, a chance to, to meet the other. And meet the other is one of the most challenging uh, issues, not only in Syria, as you, as you know. But this was another successful, partially successful experiment of bottom uh, up. Uh, we can name it like this building of the conflict, the conflicting uh, attempt in, in Syria. Other, uh, other example, but that is more, and I'm quite at the end of my, my presentation, uh, trying to imagine the Syria of uh, tomorrow, not only from a conflict point of view, but also from a peace building point of view. What happened in Homs or in Talat al Malik, the, firm, the, the first uh, example at local level, we can see ongoing or in the future also at the national scale. Trying to see all these civil society, local society group uh, connecting each other not only at the neighborhood level, not only at the village level, but at city level or at regional uh, level. Again, not using politics as the entry point, but using, for instance, professionals, engineers or master planners of homes 
Aleppo, Damascus reconstruction, the hashtag is reconstruction, how to try to raise the awareness of local people in order to defend ourselves, to resist ourselves to the master plan that is coming up from Damascus, from the government, or from the Russian, or from the Iranians. Trying to, to, do, to organize workshops in all of the cities without having the idea of opposing to a political project, but we know that the master plan is a political project too. Trying to, um, to talk to the authorities at local level, first of all, in order to, uh, be advo to advocate the, the needs of the local communities. But let's do at the Syrian level, not only at the Aleppo side, at the Aleppo level, at Damascus level, and so on. We know there are some barriers, not only trench front line like Idlib, uh, Aleppo, Idlib, Hama, or the Euphrates River, the first map was the natural barrier. The Friday's River is still a limit, it's still a borderline between the red and the, uh, and the yellow, or between pro-US Kurds in Syria and the uh, Iranian Russian uh, government of Syria area. But beyond the barriers, we can also imagine something that is beyond the regional uh, and international layers. We do know that this, for instance, I just put them for the first ones that, uh, that came to my mind talking about Syria, but we should not only think that the regional and international rivalries are uh, having an impact on the Syrian conflict and also on the Syrian and Iraqi peace. I uh, could have a few slides, but I don't know what time is, and I can end here and we can uh, start the debate.